Welcome everyone to this year's Davos Agenda Week, a very special one. No snow, and we're all here online. I'm Li Xing from Taishin Media, and our topic for today's Taishin debate is responding to COVID-19 crisis. As many, of you, as many of you have noticed, there will be two similar sessions touch upon the experiences from the East Hemisphere and the West. Today is January 25th. I remember very vividly a year ago in Davos, we were discussing the lockdown in Wuhan and how serious this new disease would be. I remember at a corner of the Congress Hall in Davos, I asked a Chinese scientist how long this new virus would be around us. And he said, no one knows. It's going to be a year or several years. Where are we now today? After spending a year with a tragedy beyond our wildest imagination, nearly 90 million cases of COVID-19 have been reported worldwide with more than 1.8 million lives were lost. Crisis should not be wasted. What has happened? What can be learned? What are the most effective response and recovery efforts we have in various countries? And what recommendations on how business and governments can actually improve and increase their collaboration across the region? We have with us today distinguished speakers from the government, from business, and also from international organizations. Let me introduce them to you now. Um, start with Minister Nanaya Mahuda, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade of New Zealand, and uh, Mrs. Shobana. Kamineni, Executive Vice Chairperson of Apollo Hospital Enterprise, based in India. Ms. Gong Ying Ying, Founder and Chairwoman of Edu Tech, based in China. And last but not least, Peter Maurer, President of International Committee of the Red Cross. And also welcome all of you who are guests online, watching the live streaming or joining us in Zoom. We have about 45 minutes on the topic and I want to make sure we have at least 10 minutes for Q&A. So please send your questions via the Zoom Q&A function. And also if you want to tweet this session, please make sure you use the hashtag Davos Agenda and at WEF. Without further ado, let me turn to our panelists today. Let me start with Minister Mahuda. New Zealand has slightly more than 2,000 COVID cases and 25 deaths. The figures are telling. I don't need to re-emphasize what scale of the achievement that is. What lessons do you think the world at this stage should get from New Zealand? I wanted to acknowledge your role as moderator, Lishan, and to the other panellists who are joining in this conversation, uh, which is such an important time to regroup and gather uh, our collective experience so that we can learn uh, from each other. Uh, let me first characterise uh, the experience in a very pacific way. We're all in the same storm and the uh, way in which we've uh, chosen to respond and navigate our way through the storm has slightly differed. However, there are some key features uh, that we can draw on to help us uh, get through the other end because we're not there yet. Our Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Jacinda Ardern, said very early uh, when the outbreak emerged uh, and was evident here in New Zealand that the best economic response is a health response. So New Zealand undertook to go hard and go early in terms of taking quite uh, severe and strong steps towards uh, a lockdown because our approach was around an agile elimination strategy. We've also made it really clear that as a country, as a government, uh, we wanted to ensure that we were taking a science-based informed approach in order to not only respond where we must, but also educate the public around a global pandemic and a number of factors that were still being understood as we were trying to respond along the way. Uh, our elimination strategy had some key tools. Uh, uh, that we deployed and are continuing to deploy uh, in our response. Uh, that is, uh, it, and it has three parts, to test, to trace, and to isolate. Uh, but you can well understand that we had to build capability along the way in each of those 
three key pillars of our response so that we had not only the right um, uh, approach and methodology, but the people capability and continue to refine uh, some of the technology to help us uh, use these particular uh, tools. Uh, while we have been looked to as a country with much success just recently, uh, we've had a uh, uh, one case uh, of community transmission, which we really can't uh, talk too much about until we get further information. But can I say we have remained ever vigilant about the task uh, ahead of us in 2021 and continuing to learn uh, from our approach in 2020. We we're just coming through the other end of our summer break and it was really important for us uh, as a government to ensure that our team of 5 million had the opportunity to experience a summer holiday uh, because as we look around the world, there is a lot of fatigue around uh, responding to COVID and how communities, families, governments are coping with the day-to-day -day task of uh, addressing uh, the pandemic. So uh, a key element of enabling us to go into a successful summer break period with Christmas uh, and the like was to ensure that we emphasised our test, trace, isolate approach uh, and also emphasised through a public campaign how important it is for our team of 5 million to be a part of an ongoing effort to keep each other safe. This by, by and large has been a major part of our success and no doubt uh, there may well be questions uh, along the way. Another key element has been the government's task to lean into supporting economic recovery because of the impact of closing borders, uh, the impact of not having international students, uh, tourism being significantly impacted and what that did to our domestic economy. So we weren't prepared uh, to sit by and let things uh, just uh, take, a, take a course uh, that we couldn't have a greater input in and we introduced a 50 billion COVID uh, recovery fund and made some significant investments primarily to support our uh, local domestic economy and also to ensure as quickly as possible we could get our, our supply chains and goods to market as quickly as we can to be a part of our recovery. We're also politically ensuring that we are talking with our closest neighbours and across the Pacific around travel bubbles and quarantine-free travel. Uh, there is a commitment to Australia and also we've opened up our first quarantine-free quarantine travel arrangement with the Cook Islands and having further discussions with other realm countries. Our focus right at the moment uh, is on uh, securing uh, vaccinations and preparing for a vaccination rollout. We've given an undertaking to ensure equity of access uh, to uh, vaccine rollout across uh, many of the Pacific uh, countries. And importantly, uh, we are continuing to educate our own population about timeframes and what to expect uh, in terms of a vaccination rollout. If you were to ask me right now, what would 2021 uh, be, uh, mean for New Zealand uh, in terms of our COVID response? Uh, primarily, it means that we will continue to be vigilant around, again, isolating uh, any outbreak within our communities, educating the public, continuing to rebuild and regenerate our workforce capabilities so that they are not fatigued uh, in our own local response, and educating the public about uh, how we intend to approach a vaccination rollout. So I think in terms of opening remarks, we are learning as we go. We don't uh, believe we have all the answers, but we are taking very much, again, a science-based approach. We are continuing to refine and learn um, from experiences overseas and also from taking on expert advice. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. So go early, go strong, and stay vigilant and also educate the public. That allows New Zealand to protect life and also protect the livelihood by how the elimination strategy, which works very well to uh, 
uh, working the new area where the uh, countries will open up. We'll uh, bring that question to the Q and A session. But let me turn from the five million size of question to a one point three billion size of question. Shobana, uh, Apollo Hospital is on the front line for the battle in India. We all know it's a massive challenge given the size of the population. What are the priorities now and looking forward to you and to India? Uh, hi, Dishan. And like you said, uh, you know, I was in Davos uh, probably around the same time. And uh, last year, doing a conference with Dr. Tedros, and he was called away to discuss this, the pandemic and, and how it was evolving. And I would think that one thing that all of us have learned is the definition of time is not anything that it's been over, you know, uh, over our lifetime. It's, it's somewhat like we've lived like 10 or more lifetimes over this last one year and uh, starting into the pandemic. So how do, at the end of it, I'd really want to talk about how we define success, but we went in hard with testing, protect, treat, and, and you know, went through so many protocols. Uh, the best thing was that I think that the world started collaborating not just in the way that the vaccine has come out now, but even earlier on in terms of protocols and medicines. So I think that that has really reduced the loss of life and people that have recovered from uh, fr from the uh, you know from having COVID. And and I would think that that would go up in a big in strategy to say that collaboration, not just the private sector and the government in every country, even ours but also with the world that we had open access. This was a time when people shared much more freely. And the second thing is that apart from protocols is, is about logistics. This has really been a case, not just in the early days of being able to get enough masks and PPEs and ventilators, but I think even at a deeper level in terms of how to actually get the drugs to all the countries and move countries that did it better that were able to, and I would say India is fortunate that not only were we uh, for a long time a manufacturing base of, of all these medicines, so we were able to put it out fast and also at an affordable price. So, so the actual damage for 1.3 billion, if we had had to do it at, at the same pricing that the rest of the world did it, we would have been, uh, I think that three generations, three to four generations from now would have been paying the price of, of this one year that we went through. So I'd like to put out there that, uh, that we did have some amount of infrastructure. The second thing is how we managed it. I think it, every state did it slightly different and engaged differently because we're, we're a collective of states where slightly the health is a federal subject. But having said that, uh, you will see that if you measure that we might not be, uh, we, we we're way more populous than New Zealand, but if you actually take the number of deaths proportion wise, it would measure up to the best in the world. And I think that comes from several factors that uh, science will will unveil, but, but I think fundamentally, it's also the ability to be able to contain it and to keep it and to put this strict social distancing lockdowns, masking, all that I think will continue to be the way forward. Coming to the present about the vaccine, we do know that 56.7 million doses of the vaccine have been given in 52 countries. India is about the highest. We, ha we will have by the end of this, the biggest vaccine program in the world. We started with, with an incredible stockpile because uh, two of the world's cheapest vaccines are at, and effective now vaccines are being manufactured in India. So I think that uh, uh, that supply is not going to be a problem for us. The big problem for us is going to be how can we actually get it out there? We, we have success in polio, but I, I do think that, you know, this has a six month expiry, the medicines, so uh, the vaccines. So, so just getting it out there, um, I, this is a this is going to be a, become a bigger effort, and this is the big challenge of what's going to take place before. I think that if even one vaccine expires, 
it could be such i mean it, it it's it's just wasting a life so so to me that's a big point and i'd like to end at the end of definition of success definition of success is how much we we can we don't take this problem forward to the next generation but also that that we're able to you know that that we're able to do some of the things that we didn't do like the, you know ncds tb the and so many of these people that have fallen to poverty now that we can breathe we're actually seeing the second order effects that covid brought it might not have killed so many it might not have infected but it definitely destroyed many many lives in different ways and i think that that today that's the second crisis that many countries especially ours are dealing with it's a very important reminder and um and also wish you bear in mind what's really the definition of success um let me move on to another 1.4 billion size of question and uh, with you in ying ying is a young entrepreneur but a company which just launched its ipo a couple of weeks ago helps bring hospital uh, helps hospitals to bring their data online and i think that's very critical at this moment so what differences digitalization and ai can make in terms like this given your experience in china ying thank thank you li xin uh, so uh, Uh, good afternoon, every, everybody, and uh, we are honored to be on this panel, uh, especially after this uh, uh, this uh, uh, very eventful year. I remember uh, early in January that I was in Davos, and uh, we were talking about the uh, Wuhan, and uh, and uh, but later on, uh, I quickly flew back to China, and uh, my company has been heavily involved in working with. Uh, 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 multiple regional CDCs, as well as uh, as uh, as China CDCs, and uh, I think, uh, and also we 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 send a team uh, into Wuhan uh, during the uh, during Wuhan lockdown, and uh, and so we had a lot of firsthand experiences in terms of uh, the usage of uh, of uh, medical AI and technology in uh, when, when when we are facing a, a pandemic like this and uh, and i think early on we were very lucky that uh, we we quickly identified uh, you know the correlation between multiple factors for one purpose that is uh, to strike the balance between mortality rate And uh, and economic activity. So all of our our our, our the technology capabilities and algorithm algorithms were were made for that purpose to minimize uh, the impacts of uh, of a pandemic control and uh, on economy, uh, and as well as trying to precisely manage the risky area and uh, and be precise in terms of uh, the area that we need to that needs to be tested. And also, um, also, uh, you know, plan early and have timely alert. So, 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 in conclusion, three uh, highlights I want to share with everybody um, in terms of, I, you know, my view of 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 the success uh, in China. One is, uh, you know, always the the pandemic simulation. Use technology to simulate and predict uh, what's hap- what's going to happen. You you may not always be correct. But but you know it, uh, what, as as the system learn it gets more accurate so you can plan early in terms of your medical supplies in terms of uh, you know policies uh, that needs to be uh, that needs to be addressed so it, it, we already see a lot of uh, uh, policies because we see a massive uh, trend in uh, the Chinese New Year traffic coming in and uh, and uh, and the, the system predicts and simulate. Uh, the, you know the infection rates going up. And then you know the, the the more optimal policy can be uh, can be applied to the society. And the second thing is uh, early alert and more automated and uh, precision response that uh, you can highlight the risky area, let the public know early. You know if they've been the risky areas and uh, and also you can you can prioritize your testing capabilities to. Test the, the area with uh, with, with the highest risk, 
and uh, proactively test. So, uh, so, so you find those infected patients early and uh, to prevent high mortality rate and, uh, and further infection. And third thing is, I think, you know, we, we still have a lot of work in terms of the disease research that uh, I think the scientists and uh, needs to globally need to work together uh, in terms of, uh, in term of uh, vaccination, drugs and treatments and, uh, and stuff. And we, we already see a lot of progress during the past year, but we, we have a long way to go um, in, in all those areas. So, uh, so I guess the, this is the experience that uh, that uh, we we had for the for the for the past year, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, globally people can start working together on those key areas because uh, we um, I, I, we still see you know quite a turbulent uh, 2021 uh, in terms of uh, vaccine supplies as well as uh, drug discoveries and uh, and the certain areas of uh, the disease control. Thank you, thank you, Yingying. Thanks for sharing the underground experiences, especially uh, the private sector's contribution, also the critical role the tech can play in this effort. So let's move on to Peter. You have a more global perspective, how you would grade the global response to the pandemic, what lessons we should learn and uh, what alarming signs you see now. Well, thanks a lot uh, for having me on this uh, on this panel, maybe just uh, to remind everybody, it may be a global view, but also a specific view, because our core activities are basically focused on the most fragile context, uh, war and violence struck in societies where war and violence fragility are also exacerbated by climate change, underdevelopment, poverty, uh, governance issues, and more and that's the core activities where ICRC was active. I think I wanted to make five brief points uh, and observations. First, in the context in which uh, we are primarily operating the 30 most vulnerable and fragile contexts of the world, some of what has been said by my previous speaker was right as well to do in those contexts. Fast and early reaction and uh, preventive uh, activities addressed to the most fragile populations, the internally displaced, the refugees, the detainees, and having preventive material PPC and all distancing rules coming to those most fragile contexts. And I think our fast reaction has been positive in uh, mitigating uh, the spread uh, of COVID-19 in those contexts. In those contexts, though, uh, we have also seen that the secondary impact of the pandemic was more important than the primary. Uh, less immediate health impact and more social economic impact from government decisions on lockdowns, which has heavily affected the informal economic sector, income possibilities of the poorest. So this was maybe my first point to, uh, to highlight here that in many of the contexts of the most vulnerable contexts, COVID has accelerated, exacerbated fragilities, but rather on the secondary impact than on the primary health impact. My second point I wanted to make that while this has been a global pandemic, we have seen in many of the contexts in which we work, very contextual impact. COVID has been a global priority of the international community, but when we look at real challenges, it hasn't been the top priority in each and every context in which we work. And therefore, we had to be very contextual in seizing on, in right-sizing the response uh, to COVID because not in each and every context, the pandemic has the same dynamic with communicable, non-communicable diseases, with other fragilities which we are operating. My third uh, point I wanted to make, while uh, this is a pandemic which has affected millions of individuals, at the end of the day, the big challenge is health systems, stabilizing and strengthening health systems. Where the health systems have been particularly fragile 
it has been particularly difficult to respond. Our recognition not only from COVID-19, but from many other pandemics in past decades in which we have been operating is that pandemics hit hardest when health systems as overall fail. And therefore our first lessons learned is we have to fix those systems and not just respond short term and temporarily. Fourth point I wanted to highlight is the importance of trust building in policy measures against pandemics. I think we have been best and we have been most effective and efficient where we have been closest to communities, to local communities, to consensus building in local communities, to trust building. And we can't sort of top down respond to the pandemic if there is no engagement, trust and buy-in for the measures you take by the communities with which you operate. And finally, and fifthly, I think this has highlighted once again that the pandemic is, pandemics are such big issues that we cannot continue to work in the same way we have been working before. We need new arrangements between organizations, value chains for impacting uh, the response on pandemic, which changes fundamentally the way we work, the way we respond, the way we organize ourselves, the way we, man we are mandated to do things, the way we finance uh, our response. So it leads to quite a fundamental way on first time frontline responders in uh, health and humanitarian crises in which we work. I'll stop it here. Thank you, Peter. Very comprehensive. I uh, draw down a lot of notes ranging from the uh, contextual impact to uh, the importance of trust building and your arrangements. We'll come back to many of the points later, but I'll give a reminder to our guests online that now time is for you to submit your questions. I have a few, but I also get a question from the floor as well from, uh, um, uh, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, Mr. In Inan Wu Raham. Rahman, CEO of Dalwood Hercules Corporation. His question is, what policy interventions can help overcome the mental fatigue being seen due to the pandemic? We've been with this for a year and how to overcome the fatigue and make sure our policies are still, people still respond to the policies. Who will take that? Probably I'll invite our Minister Mahuta first. There are a few, uh aspects we had to consider along the way. And while not directly uh, focused on the fatigue element, I think in terms of societal fatigue and stress and anxiety around the economic impacts, our COVID uh, economic response was designed primarily to allay some of the intermediary challenges of businesses thinking how would they make it through a lockdown and out the other end? So we were very uh, mindful uh, that we had to create uh, some buffering support to cushion the economic impact on our uh, business sector. Uh, we were mindful, and that uh, materialised in wage subsidies, small business loans, um, things like that. We were also mindful that we needed to ensure fairly quickly, and this comes um, to the point that was made uh, earlier by one of the speakers around supply chain, especially when we were sourcing PPE gear, uh, that we had a two-way opportunity to guarantee um, uh, PPE gear uh, being sent to New Zealand, but also similarly being able to get food uh, to uh, receiving markets. And Singapore was one of the earlier uh, supply chains that opened up to us. And then if I think about workforce fatigue, especially within the health sector, uh, it was to ensure that we had enough agility within our system. And this goes to uh, what Mr. Murray was talking about in relation to agility and new ways of working, uh, that we enabled our community health workforce to work very aligned with our tertiary health workforce to relieve some of the pressure around things like testing. Uh, so many of those things we um, 
learnt along the way and responded very quickly, designed the policies and where necessary legislation. Now, one of the key legislative uh, areas where we had to uh, respond quickly was in the scenario where we went from a nationwide lockdown to regional lockdowns and then needed some empowering mechanisms for our um, uh, our uh, key workers to be able to enforce uh, what a regional lockdown would mean, closing regional borders, uh, enabling our uh, uh, first responders to have certain powers that they wouldn't normally uh, have in a uh, in a usual situation for a health response. Uh, so those were some of the things that we learnt along the way and we designed policies and legislation when necessary to empower and enable our uh, our local response. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Mahuda. The second question um, is from Mr. Fasil Ali Ibrahim, the uh, Vice Minister of, uh, uh, at the Ministry of Economy and Planning of Saudi Arabia about vaccine. What does a successful vaccine rollout look like? And uh, what are some of the key obstacles or concerns with a success, successful vaccine rollout? Any thoughts on how to overcome them? And I'll add also one question to that is, when when do you think the vaccine will bring back the normal life uh, back to us? Uh, a new normal, of course. Shobana, please. Uh -huh. Yeah. So so we did a, uh, we did a mapping in, in Apollo. And actually, uh, it started with supply chain because again we had that backing and we looked at what the vaccine is so so one is that the challenge in many countries is to is to be able to do the the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines which require very sophisticated uh, supply chains so I think it's it's important to understand that that you need a vaccine a successful vaccine is a something that you know of course you can't do it at room temperature but but which can take this, the, the supply chains normally available, which is between two to eight degrees. And I think that there's quite a bit of capacity in a country like India that did polio and has many, we realized, we realized that we already had 80% capacity of, for, such a, for such a supply chain uh, to be able to vaccinate almost, we, we were looking, uh, India is looking at vaccinating almost 500 million people. Uh, in, in the first law. Having said that, 80% available in the 2 to 8%. Next is, if you can get a vaccine that most vaccines today that are available need two doses. So you have to plan the logistics, not just of giving the first do dose, but having enough and reminding this, the people to come back. Otherwise, it's not completely effective. But uh, John, Johnson & Johnson is coming out with a with a single dose, so I think that would be successful. The third is you look at pricing and you say, what can countries afford? So countries like India, we can afford our current vaccine that is, you know, fortunately, I must say that the COVAX Alliance, so how do equitable access, so Gavi, CEPI and all the others, come WHO coming together to be able to make sure that vaccine is, is equitable access and affordable. So today our vaccine, I think, is being sold. Uh, the one in India the, uh, is being sold at, at $2. And I think that compared to a Moderna at 30 and then plus for a Pfizer. So I think these, these to me are, are the fundamentals. And then getting it out there and making sure. So we have a country of huge, uh, we have a country of huge geography. And I think that to be able to get it out there and the cold chain that, uh, public and private and who are the vaccinators. So, so the actual math that has been done by the government and, and hopefully now the private will get involved. Uh, uh, it's just mammoth to be able to open it up. So I think that just uh, whatever the safe points are, so we have to make sure that this vaccine is given safe and given at large scale. So 500 million for us is a big target. We need to be able to do it in the next year uh, to bring this country back to normal. So I think that the way that the US is doing it and all that, uh, uh, the last thing I'd like to add is who should get it first? So we, in India, it's the healthcare workers, it's the frontline workers of the, of the sanitation, the, the police, the army, 
and 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 then the people over 50 especially the ones with comorbidities so i think that when one of the speakers spoke about giving it to the most uh, vulnerable those are the categories so i think that should be the prioritization thank you peter do you have anything to add yeah, I just wanted to uh, really uh, emphasize what has been uh, said by Shivana, but uh, maybe add that in addition to equitable and affordable, uh, I think one of the big challenges for us is really to access non-government controlled areas. I just remind you that between 60 and 70 million people in the world live in areas not reached by any Ministry of Health and Government authorities. So for us, success also looks in achieving to reach those areas because uh, pandemics don't uh, know or can't know ungoverned spaces and unreached spaces because we would have then flip overs again into other areas. And the second is uh, really that it doesn't, an, a successful vaccination campaign is not at the cost of other vaccines. We see already at the present moment that between 60 and 70 countries have reduced uh, other forms of vaccina vaccinating populations because of the focus on COVID and have re reduced and, uh, other forms of vaccines. So success also is success which does not come at the cost of other communicable and non-communicable diseases, health uh, support and other vaccination campaigns. That's a very important reminder that for this particular disease, that success has to be success for all and it shouldn't come at a cost of other critical. Uh, uh, Nishin, in some places, uh, many people like today were saying that let private sector participate more. So sometimes too much government also is not the right solution. I think that should be a cue. I want to uh, hear from Yin Ying as well, a question for you that as a private sector, you collaborate with the government early on at the local level. What tips you can give for building a strong government and private collaboration in crisis like this and to make sure some of the efforts are long lasting? Um, I think um, uh, I would say a balanced, um, of, uh, a balanced approach would be the best answer because I, uh, luckily I think in China, we have a very strong government led. So even if the, you know, us as a private company, we still work, we're still working under the, the whole architecture design of, uh, of, uh, of China CDC and the regional CDC. So that gave us a lot of advantage in terms of, uh, 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 in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, plan ahead and uh, and uh, and uh, based on the simulation that uh, we 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 did with uh, with uh, our technology, and that's very very important. That, you know, when the vaccination comes out, because uh, obviously the production volume is uh, is gonna uh, is gonna gradually uh, roll up to the to the desired volume, and uh, the efficient the effective. Uh, time ranges between six months to uh, more than a year, as people still need to come back and take the second shots and the and the and the, and the third shots. So uh, so effective planning is um, it is very very important when you have a limited uh, medical supplies and uh, limited uh, vaccination, and uh, and also a planned. Uh, a planned um, a planned approach is also important when when you are expecting a massive amount of uh, traveling uh, between the country uh, be, between uh, within the countries, and uh, and in terms of uh, you know I think uh, I would want to highlight you know response fast early uh, is uh, is extremely important and uh, during our experiences with or without the vaccine and. Uh, it just lowered the mortality rate and uh, and the precisely means that you don't, don't have a massive lockdown and uh, you lock up the specific areas so uh, so you minimize the impacts in the in, in the society and we you know from our model we we don't see we don't see a you know 
miraculously the society just go back goes back to normal um, uh, because there's a vaccine, right? It also limits yeah the, the rollouts of uh, of people taking the vaccine uh, together with uh, international travel policies as well as uh, the research we're doing for this particular disease. And uh, and uh, it's not just about China, and uh, it oh, it's not just about Asia. And, uh, I think globally, we we, we uh, people will realize that we need a planned um, kind of uh, working together approach to uh, to come this uh, uh, pandemic to go back to the normal that uh, we're used to. Otherwise, it will be uh, you know a, a club of people with vaccination and uh, and very low mortality rates, and there will be areas without treatments, vaccination, or what Peter mentioned, the, the government uh, the government reach, and uh, and uh, and that would have a very uh, I would expect a disastrous impacts in terms of uh, economy, global. Economy. We see, uh, you know, in terms of uh, countries helping each other. Thank you. Thank you, Yingying. Another question, um, also uh, coming from a comment we heard a lot last year, is where is the international collaboration when we need it most? The international collaboration of the early virus control was deplorable at best. So now we're moving on to the vaccine. And, um, the question is, what will be an appropriate coordinated response across government to tackle vaccine misinformation? And this question comes from, forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, Mr. Tenku Mohammed Ta Taufik Tenku Aziz, the president and group CEO of Petronas Malaysia. So who would like to tackle, who would like to take the uh, vaccine misinformation question? Maybe I'll turn to uh, Minister Mahuda again. Uh, in terms of the approach that we're taking, because we have to build confidence in New Zealand that in, that in securing vaccinations that we have a robust uh, domestic assurance process uh, through which we will uh, pass the vaccinations through and then uh, roll out. So we have a MedSafe uh, standard, our own standard, uh, that uh, in part is well understood uh, by our uh, population and would, um, I think, help uh, in the effort to roll out the vaccination uh, to our communities and then across the Pacific. Uh, so we are going through the process at this moment of uh, explaining uh, how that uh, MedSafe process will align uh, to the vaccines that we're securing as well as securing information uh, from the clinical trials and the uh, rollout experiences of donor countries uh, in this area. Um, if I was to be absolutely frank in terms of the scale of our, uh, or let me say the, the, the scale, the, the nature of the challenge that we have here in New Zealand um, is to try and ensure that uh, the body of um, knowledge around uh, vaccination for COVID is not um, overshadowed by views within our community around vaccinations per se. So we are, we are grappling with that. There is, you know, there are communities uh, within our population who are anti-vaccine uh, of any kind. Uh, so again, our, our effort is around building good information uh, assure, assurance of our, our own domestic process, MedSafe, uh, as we roll out the vaccinations and looking towards the experiences of other countries. We're running short of time, but I saw the hand from Shobana is up. So if you want to give a very quick comment. A uh, real quick comment is three stages of vaccine, that once you get you know people out there who want the vaccine, and we're seeing that's declining day by day as more information is out. There are three. One is that, you know, we have vaccine shortage at this point. There's less than the world really wants. The second is when it becomes equitable. But then what we're looking at six months from now, there are going to be almost 100 vaccines out. So there's going to be a glut. So the world has to even think about such a situation. And, and not just that this vaccine is there for this year, 
and for COVID. COVID is here to stay. And you're going to need this vaccine year after year after year. So it'll become almost like a flu shot. So, so I think that this has become this this is going to become something that is there for the world. Thank you almost so much. Yeah. And uh, with that very encouraging note, I think we have to wrap up this very informative and inspiring session. And I want to quote Shobana and says, in the last year, we actually feel we lived many lives in one year. And I hope we all emerge out of this wiser and uh, smarter in how we build our post-COVID world. Thank you so much for sharing with us your wonderful insights today. And I hope I can meet you all next year in the snow in Davos again.